Dutch choir. Uh, they'll be rehearsing this afternoon at 4 uh, 4 30 with uh, the folks from Enry in two weeks. Uh, next next Sunday night, in fact, we'll be in Enry at six o'clock uh, presenting the Christmas musical Brand New Hallelujah. And then on the following Sunday, the 11th, here at six o'clock. So make your plans uh, to attend. Come thou fount of every blessing, a great old hymn. Let's stand together as we uh, sing this together. <coughs> Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Strings of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? 
the Father truly love us? He does. And does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. So I sent a new worship song to you this week. Because worship is not about what we're doing on this platform. Worship is about us showing to Almighty God his worth to us. The Bible says that where, it talks about the treasures of the heart. I wonder how much we treasure him today. And so we're going to sing this song. I want you to, I want this to become part of our worship here. And I've asked Pat to sing the first verse or so. And then when the choir or the praise team jumps in, you can. Because he is the one that is worthy. Sing it together. All the saints and angels bow before your throne. All the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God and sing. You are worthy of it all. 
Let's let the name of our Lord be praised. Amen. Amen. come into your presence today understanding that that none of this is about us it's totally always and only for you and worship only happens when we understand that so lord i pray today that like incense of old that our praises and worship have risen today and that you are pleased in jesus name amen Well, amen. Good morning, church. Good to see each of you today. Glad that each of you are here. I, I want to share a letter with you. Uh, forgive my voice today. I, I don't know why I'm hoarse. <laughs> I, I promise I didn't, I didn't scream. I didn't yell except at the very end, Joe, that's the honest truth, all right? It's the honest, Pat can tell you, I, I kept it under a low roar yesterday. But I just think it's allergies or whatnot, but uh, hallelujah, amen. <laughs> 
we got a very kind letter. A few weeks ago when we had Sacrifice Sunday, you, you just gave a wonderful, wonderful offering to First Baptist Entery. And we got the kindest note, and uh, we wanted to read it and you to hear this today. Dear Scott and members of Popper Springs Baptist Church, on behalf of the First Baptist Church of Entery, I want to offer my gratitude and appreciation for your gift to our church from your offering on Sacrifice Sunday. Words cannot express how deeply thankful we are for your kindness and generosity. I remember many conversations with Pastor Dale about how proud he was to belong to a church with such a generous and giving spirit. What incredible way to honor him and his legacy among you. Your gift to our church will go above and beyond anything you could ever imagine as we use it to impact our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We could not be more excited to be in partnership with you to see the kingdom of God advance in our community, our state, our country, and around the world. May the Lord richly bless you. We give thanks to God every time we remember you in the name of Jesus, uh, Pastor Andy Moore. Isn't that a kind letter? And so, church, thank you for just being who you are, and thank you for your generosity and your willingness to give, and uh, God gets the glory for it all. I um, really wasn't really sure where I was going to go today, but I was walking one afternoon and early evening, and John chapter 6, I just got to, I got to reading it, got to thinking through it, and to be honest, really hadn't planned to preach it necessarily. I think, you know, there are times that God speaks to me about me, right? Every time I go to the, to the presence of the Lord, it's not about getting a sermon. Because ideally, I want to get in the presence of the Lord because I want Him. And I want to know Him. And I want to I be with Him. And so there's times that God speaks to me. There are times that God gives me a word. And I think that word is just for me. And so there's, there is truth to that here, okay? I do believe God gave me a word from the word that he gave me. He gave me a rhema out of the logos. So the logos is the complete revelation of God's word. The rhema is a word that God can use to speak directly to you. And so I do believe God gave me a word, and I was so excited about that. But then I couldn't shake it, and the more I couldn't shake it, the more I thought, okay, I just, I, you know, I got nothing else. <laughs> so I'm going to give it to you, all right? And I, I do think it's a great word. So I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Uh, do you all like leftovers? Well, I am so glad to hear that because I know a lot of people, they don't like leftovers, there are some things that are so much better the next day. Green beans, for some reason to me, are always better the second day. Lasagna is always better the second day. And so I don't know what you did with all your leftovers. We try to be as creative as possible. So if there's ham left over, we're going to eat some ham sandwiches. Somebody say amen. And then we get sick of that, we make ham salad out of it, right? And then there's turkey, then you can make turkey salad. You just do all these kind of wonderful creative things. Now, there are some things that aren't meant to be leftovers. Grits. <laughs> Grits were never meant to be a leftover. That's why you have to eat them while they're hot, okay? Butter, salt. Do not put sugar in your grits. That is not southern. I don't even think it's American, all right? <laughs> so put the sugar in the tea. Somebody say amen, all right? Put the sugar in the tea. So, so leftovers. Well, today I want to preach a message entitled Leftovers. Because that's what happens in this text. So look with me in John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And I... I hope you don't get tired of this as long as I'm going to be filling the pulpit. I'm just going to ask you every Sunday to do a thing that I truly do believe in. 
And I'm going to ask you to stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. As a matter of fact, hold your Bible or your phone device up and say this with me. This is the Bible. It is God's holy, infallible, inerrant, perfect, life-giving, life-changing Word. Listen to these familiar verses. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now, isn't that a beautiful picture? Jesus wanting to be with his disciples. I'm telling you, church, listen. This is not in my notes, but this is the right time to say this. Jesus wants to be with you. He wants to fellowship with you. Verse 4, now the Passover, the feast of the Jews was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough if each of them got a little. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves. Barley. Did you know that barley is a picture of, of weakness? That barley was the lowest possible grain. It was the poor man's bread. Okay, I just want, you, you need to understand that. That's why, that's why it's significant, okay? Barley. Matter of fact, I could show you in the Old Testament that barley was a picture of, of, of uh, even, even like the sin offering, part of that was to bring barley, okay? It was the grain of the animals. So there's something significant there. Weak, lowly, okay? Don't forget that. There's a boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Many Bible scholars believe there were as many as 20,000 people. Okay? 5,000 men, if those men were married, if they had a couple of kids. So you get the picture, right? So I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. There were many more than just 5,000, but they, for sure the Bible recorded there 5,000 men. So I'm going to use today the number 20,000. Can you imagine 20,000 people on a hillside? And Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. That is so good. As much as they want. This was like a buffet. As much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told the disciples, gather up the leftover. There it is. Gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. Your translation may say wasted. Let nothing be lost. Let nothing be wasted. And so they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this indeed, the prophet who has come into the world. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are Thank you that we know today that you are King of kings and Lord of lords, and besides thee there is none other. We come into your presence today, Lord, to, to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, we know that you truly deserve all glory today. And so, Lord, I pray that our worship has been sweet and that it will continue to be sweet as, Lord, we want to worship you now through the preaching of your word. 
And God, I believe that you want to speak to us today. And Lord, I pray that you will speak to us today. God, give us ears to hear. Give us a heart that's ready to receive. I pray, God, that we would have a, a, a will today that would submit to your will and that whatever you bring to us today, God, that we would receive it and that we would obey whatever you say today. Now, Lord, I don't know every person that's here today. I don't know everything they may be going through. I have no idea what someone online who is listening even now, God may be going through. And so, Lord, I pray that we would truly sit at your feet and that when we leave today that we can say that we have been with Jesus. And we pray that today. Amen and amen. God bless you. You be seated. This is one of my, I, I, you know, this is probably one of the most public miracles that Jesus ever performed. So these crowds of people, I mean, the, things were going well. The, the disciples were watching God do some miraculous things. If you just stay when, inside the book of John, you know in chapter 2, there was the first miracle. There's the, the wedding at Cana. Jesus cleansed the temple and, and uh, does the, the right thing there, shares in John 3 uh, and all the wonderful words there of Nicodemus. Jesus begins to, to minister to the, the woman of Samaria. He heals heals a man at the porch on the, the Sabbath. He, he heals an official son. So, so these men have seen Jesus do some amazing things. And so now the crowds are gathering. Why? The Bible tells us, this text tells us that they are all coming because Jesus is doing all these signs and wonders. It's blowing their minds. Okay, and so they, they, they are looking for a king. They're looking for a leader, and so they are fascinated by Jesus. Matter of fact, this miracle is recorded in all four of the Gospels. And if you look at each four, it'll kind of give you some insight in different ways. They really wanted to be alone, really needed a time out. You know, when you get wore out, you just need some rest, right? And, and, and let's just be honest. People are needy. I'm needy. You're needy. We're all needy, right? And so, so here are these needy people. And sometimes when you're ministering and you're ministering and you're ministering, you just need some time away. And, and so that's the background. They're trying to get away just to rest and spend time with Jesus. Have you ever just wanted to get away? Oh, that I had wings like a dove, right? That's what the psalmist said. I would just fly away, right? Well, have you ever just wanted to get away, and as soon as you got to where you thought you could get away, you saw somebody that you knew? Okay, well, that's what happened here. And so Mark's account tells us that, that the folks were in such a frenzy that they kind of had an idea where Jesus and the disciples were going, and so they went faster, and they got there. And so by the time that the disciples and Jesus are there, they begin to see all of these people coming to hear and to see Jesus. Well, Jesus does something pretty incredible. He looks at two of his disciples and he says, okay, we need to feed them because they're hungry. And I just need, to, I need you to help me. Feed. Matter of fact, this is not my problem. This is your problem. So how in the world are we going to feed all of these people. Point number one, Jesus wants to meet your need. I don't know what you brought with you today. I, I don't know what need you may have. There, there actually could be some people here today that you really don't want to be here today. You come because you, you feel like, well, I, I probably should go to church. But, but deep in your heart, if, 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 if one more excuse could have made itself available, you might have taken it. Why? Because sometimes life can be so overwhelming and, and, and we, we, we have such a great need. And I want you to feel the weight of that today because the, the beautiful part of this text is the fact that Jesus is willing to meet your need. We are needy, but Jesus is sufficient. Now here's the good news. There is never panic in heaven. Jesus never has to call an emergency session. 
And so Jesus was not rattled by the size of this crowd. He was not rattled by the size of their need. Not at all. Jesus was in complete control of the situations. Again, how do you know that? Verse 6. He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. No panic. No panic whatsoever. Jesus is in control of every situation. He's in charge of my situation. He is in charge of your situation. No matter how overwhelming it may seem, it, 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 would it surprise you if I told you that this really, this miracle was not about food? The issue is not the food. It's what Jesus used to teach a lesson. This miracle was about faith. And the Bible makes it very clear. He's going to give these disciples a test. Don't miss that. Jesus never tempts us, but Jesus does test us. And so he's testing. And he says, Philip. Where in the world are we going to get enough money to feed all these people? You know the first thing Philip did? First thing Philip did was grab his calculator. And he is doing the math. He has got a slide rule. And he's thinking, oh, 5,000 men, 5,000 women. We got kids. Boy, them kids eat a lot. And he's just doing it on the calculator. And here's what he comes up with. Jesus, that is impossible. You ever told that to Jesus about a situation that you find yourself in? Is that how you feel today? You've got a need. You've got something going on in your life. You are pressed down. you got a need, and it feels like it is impossible. I swear, that's where Philip was. So i got good news for some of y'all today. Throw your calculators away. When you try to meet a need on your own, you will come up short every single time. If you leave out the Jesus factor and you leave out faith, you will come up short every single time. Philip said it's impossible. Now, Andrew was a little bit more proactive. He'd, at least he'd been talking to people. He'd been out in the crowd. He'd been walking around. He was very observant. I forget that you're in there sometimes. Well, that scared me to death, all right? And, uh, oh, Lord. <laughs> so, Phil, not, not Philip, Andrew. So, Andrew's been walking around and looking, and, you know, out of 20,000 people, he recognized there's only one little boy that brought a sack lunch. And did you catch what he said? He said, Lord, it, what is this against so many? Right? Do you know what? Philip said it's impossible. Andrew says it's illogical. It just doesn't make sense. The issue was never about the food. The issue was about their faith. Isn't it amazing how quick we can forget every miracle we've ever witnessed Jesus doing? And in the moment, we feel like, God, I've just been presented something that's impossible. It just can't work. I've, I've, I've done the math, Lord. It won't work. God, I thought about this. It's just not logical. It just doesn't make sense. I'm glad Jesus is willing to meet us where we are because he was sure meeting these boys where they were. And so Jesus is wanting to teach them that there are a lot of people who have needs, and he is the need meter. Don't leave out the Jesus factor. Maybe Jesus was teaching the disciples that he will always be necessary. 
that in ourselves we don't have the power to be faithful. We don't have the, the power to be wise or even good. We are people who are in continual need of help and rescue. And so Jesus is meeting the disciples there. He's testing what? He's testing their faith. Do you believe I am who I say I am? Second thing I want you to see is this. Jesus is bigger than your problems. He's just bigger. He's bigger. And you know what? When, when he begins to, to work and, and do things that, that astound us, I mean, you, you realize that Jesus never does anything halfway. I mean, if he's going to bless, he's going to abundantly bless and so the problem was, here's people, there's not enough food, what are we going to do? And then Jesus says this, okay, i tell you what we're going to do. Have the people to sit down. Verse 10, Jesus said, have the people to sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place. It's springtime. Remember, it's Passover. That's why everybody's there. You with me? So there are large crowds. It's springtime. There's, there's, there's a lot of green grass. And Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus took the loaves, and then he gave thanks. So he said, get them to sit down. And so they're all sitting down. Another gospel account says they're in 50s and 100s, but they're, they're all over the place. And I hope they weren't Baptists because they'd be fussing about where they are. I wanted that seat over there. I didn't want to sit there. You know, so they're sitting in 50s and 100s, and now Jesus says, now we're going to give thanks for the food. And everybody does this. I guarantee you there were some people looking around going, wait a minute, there ain't no food. <laughs> right? I'd have been like this, right? You could do that better than I can, Scott. Yeah, yeah, okay. Anyway. So he begins to pray, he begins to bless, he begins to, to break bread and fish, and, and when he given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. Can I just tell you something? When Jesus comes through, he didn't come through halfway. What God does, he, got, he does fully. He does abundantly. That's why the Bible says, And my God shall supply every need of you according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could think or ask. Ephesians 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places i'm telling you even our salvation he didn't do it halfway the bible says in hebrews 7 25 he is able to save to the uttermost i ought to make a methodist shout right there john owen in his great writing said christ will not bring about part of our salvation and leave what remains to ourselves and others whatever belongs to our entire complete salvation he is able to affect it the reason i'm telling you today it wasn't about food that it was about faith that a few verses later jesus made this statement i am the bread of life do you understand how audacious that statement really is? That is one of the seven I am statements in the book of John. He is saying, I am very God. Oh, I'm about to have a spell. I'm telling you, this is God in the flesh who was not rattled by the situation. He was in complete control. Why? Because he knew what he was going to do. It's not about the stomach. He was aiming for their soul because he is the bread of life. He is the one who can save. He is the one who can rescue. He is the one who satisfies. Anybody here need saving? Jesus can save you. Anybody here need rescuing? Jesus can rescue you. Hey, do you have a longing in your heart that needs to be satisfied? Listen to me. Jesus is the divine satisfier.
You got a need? Well, we got a need meter. And when they had eaten, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments. Now, don't miss this. This is incredible to me. So the Bible clearly says they ate all that they wanted and couldn't eat any more. 20,000 people. And then Jesus said, don't you dare waste the leftovers. Now, this has nothing to do with the message, but I'm just going to say it anyway. Don't dare waste the leftovers. If you don't want them, bring them to me, all right? But don't waste. Think about it. 20,000 people just been fed from, from a, a few loaves of barley bread and a couple of sardines. And now Jesus said, don't waste the leftovers. And when they gathered them, they gathered 12 baskets full. 12 baskets full. 12 disciples, 12 baskets full. Do you understand what's going on there? That was God's acclamation point to his sufficiency. So I got one more point, and I want you to, you, you got to see this. What did they offer Jesus? They offered him the only thing that they had, which was a weak, insufficient meal. Most of you probably grew up in a church culture very similar to me. And most of us have always been taught something like this. Give your best to the Lord. I don't disagree with that, right? I, I'm okay with that. Give your best to the Lord. And so if you, if you were, if you're an administrator and you've got the gift of administration, we would say, hey, give, give that gift of administration to Jesus. Let him use it for his glory. Well, that would be right. Some of you have the gift of hospitality. I've seen it. And you, you've exercised that gift, and it's a wonderful, beautiful thing. Give it to Jesus so that you can even be more hospitable and welcoming to people. I'm, just, I'm telling you, I, I've seen all kinds of gifts and giftedness in this body. And so it would be right to say, give your best to the Lord. That is not what happened here. The only thing they could give Jesus was their weakness. And I'm going to say something today that you've probably never, ever heard a preacher say. One of the greatest things that you could do today is to give Jesus your weakness. I wonder how many miracles we have missed because we didn't want to acknowledge that we have a weakness. They didn't miss the miracle. Why? Because they gave him all that they had and all that they had was a picture of weakness. Elizabeth Elliot, I, I, you know, two weeks in a row I'm going to quote Elizabeth Elliot. But listen to this powerful quote. If the only thing you have to offer is a broken heart, you offer a broken heart. Realizing that nothing I have, nothing I am will be refused on the part of Christ. I am simply to give it to him as the little boy gave his loaves and fishes. With the same feeling of the disciples when they said, what is the good of this for such a crowd. Naturally, in almost anything I offer to Christ, my reaction would be, what is the good of that? The point is, the use he makes of it is none of my business. It is his business. It's his blessing. So what have you been carrying around? What is it that your pride has refused you to be open and vulnerable to Jesus about? 
I'm telling you, revival could break out this morning if you and I would come to a holy and all-sufficient Savior and say today, I give you my weakness. Everything that I said is impossible. I give to you. Everything that I've said is illogical. I give to you. Can you imagine? When Jesus tested these disciples, it wasn't to shame them. See, some of you have a warped view of who Jesus is. You think God the Father is an old man in a rocking chair, and the moment you do something wrong, zap! That may be the God in your mind, but that is not the God of the Bible. Grace. When Jesus tested these disciples, it wasn't to shame them. It was to fill them with more of his grace. It was to teach them and to grow them, to say, I want you to trust me, and I want you to trust me more. You will never go one day in your life that you don't need me. And guess what? There's never a need that you could ever bring me that I can't handle. So I'm asking some of you to do something today. Would you bring your weakness and give it to Jesus? You know what the Bible says? The Bible says when we are weak, he is what? Strong. I, I love music. Music's a big, big part of my life. And... Um, I certainly can't sing today, and I probably should not have pushed it as hard as I pushed it. But I'm telling you, there's a fire in my bones this morning, y'all. Listen to these words. You say you're facing a mountain, there's no way around it, and you're getting weary from the climb. The burdens you carry, I know they're heavy, and there's no end in sight. The road's been long, the way's been rough, but there's a promise for the moments when you're not strong enough. Give it to God. Turn it over and lay it at his feet. Give it to God knowing that he's able to do what only he can. He's a burden bearer, so cast your every care. You can bring all that you've got. Why wait? another day give it to God so this morning as our praise team comes and they're going to lead us in an invitation here's the simple invitation is there something that you've just told God in recent days is impossible illogical and there's no way that I mean you've just made every single excuse what what could happen today if you brought that weakness and you gave that weakness, that situation, that burden, just give it to him? Now, I, I know, listen, and look, the, the great thing about being transitional pastor is I can probably take a few liberties, and I'm going to take one right now. It is more important that we give God full attention during this invitation for you to slip out and leave early. You're welcome. I don't mean that to be ugly, but here's what I want you to understand. The most important thing that's going to happen today is going to happen during this invitation. You understand that? And so... Let's let Jesus do what he wants to do. And I'm asking some of you today to swallow your pride and trust Jesus enough to bring your weaknesses to him. I'm, I'm asking you to come, fall around this altar, and give those things to Jesus. Lord, we... 
we are trusting, God, that you are speaking and that you will continue to speak. And, Lord, I pray that during this time of invitation that, God, many in this room would truly see the need to bring even our weakness, our doubts, our insufficiencies to you and to lay them at your feet. That, Lord, so many times we try to operate in our own flesh. And, Lord, we totally dismiss the Jesus factor. But, Lord, we want to acknowledge you today and know that you are Lord. We know that you're master over everything. God, we give verbal consent that nothing is bigger than you. But, Lord, volitionally, many times we really don't believe that. We say it, but we don't believe it. But, Lord, may we believe it today. And may we believe it so much that we are willing to come and just lay our weakness before you and trust you with it. That you will answer in such a way that will be abundantly more than we could ever imagine. And that you will give us a greater faith than we've ever had before. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet as our team leads us. I, again, these altars are open. If you need me, I'll be here. But I'm asking many of you today, trust Jesus enough to bring your weakness to him. Have I no
Amen. We just have a couple of things to bring to your attention. Kim, I'm going to ask you to come first. This coming Saturday evening, we have a parents' night out opportunity planned for the children of the church, and we are also opening that up to uh, the community. And uh, we need some volunteers so that the parents can actually go out. So um, if you would be willing, first of all, parents, let us know. We'll send something out this week so you can sign up if you, your kids will attend. They'll eat some pizza, watch a movie, um, do some fun. We've got some fun games and Christmas-themed crafts for them to do while they're here. That's four hours. It's from 5 to 9. If you could give up four hours of your Saturday evening, I know Clemson fans that the game is on. We can watch it on the phone, okay? But if you could give up four hours of your Saturday evening, and he's saying it doesn't matter. <laughs> it might not. But anyway, um, if four hours of your Saturday evening so that we can have an outreach to our community and outreach to our parents, let them um, get some shopping maybe for the holiday that's coming up, um, just have some time. We really want to offer that. Also, any kids that are going to be singing with us for Christmas, we are practicing today at 4 o'clock, meet here in the sanctuary in the sanctuary. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. We just sort of look at each other, make sure we're on the same page. Usually she's on the right page and uh, I'm on a page. So I appreciate that very much. Yes, if you have kids, we need them. Um, they're singing uh, the next two Sunday nights with us and also on the 18th, I believe. And also on the 18th, Disciple 5 will sing in that morning. And the choir's got special things all week. And listen, I know there's all kind of things that vie for our attention. There's all kind of things going on in all kind of churches. But guess what? This is our church. This is where God has planted us. So I hope you'll be faithful to come and support our choir, our children, our soloists as we uh, present these musicals. Now, I'm going to try to think because I left my notes somewhere of what all I was supposed to tell you. My wife, I always have to be on this page. <laughs> No. I hope everybody had a wonderful Thanksgiving, and we did have leftovers. Um, that was awesome, by the way. That was wonderful. But anyway, Thanksgiving holiday is over, and the next one coming up is Christmas. So, y'all remember how beautiful this church looked last year, last Christmas? We want to do that again. So, tomorrow night... About 6.30, I think. I think it's 6.30. Um, yeah, it's in the bulletin. It was on the screen earlier, but I think it's 6.30. Uh, we're going to be here to decorate, and we need some folks to help. We need some men to carry some big things and ladders and do things that men do. And um, women, we need y'all to help decorate and do things that women do. And we want to make this sanctuary so beautiful in honor of Christmas, in honor of Christ. Um, it's just a, a little thing that we can do. But when you walk in and remember how when you walked in and saw how beautiful it was, it's just glorious. So tomorrow night, 630, and then if we don't finish tomorrow night, we'll be back. What does it say, Joyce? It says Well, that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, mm, well, anyway, if you show up at three, the, the thing at three, we said on Tuesday, if we don't finish on Monday, then we were going to be here at three on Tuesday. So, y'all come three. I'll just. If anybody wants to, if anybody wants to come at three, I'll be here. I'll be here at three. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So six thirty tomorrow and three the next 6:30. day. Six thirty. Okay, six thirty tomorrow what, evening. That's what Janet and I had talked about. Okay. Six thirty tomorrow and three on Tuesday. Okay. Any, by any, here. any way it's going to look great come next week um 
Men, tonight, Brad, I need to see you for a moment. Um, and Johnny Dempsey, I want to see you for a moment since you're looking at Brad. Um, <laughs> let me just see y'all. Tonight at 6.30, usually we meet at 6.15 men, but at 6.30 tonight, we're going to uh, meet for our final men's gathering of um, this year. Now, that doesn't mean your groups can't meet, but I have a proposal I want to make to you this evening. And not even Pastor Ken knows what it is. So if you would be here, that would be great. We're having hot dogs, hot dogs and all the stuff. So if you want to, but now if you, if we have desserts, you have to bring them. But the hot dogs are here. So we we'll look forward to that gathering tonight. One hour and we're out. That's what we do every time. So you know that the 4th and, and the 11th we have at 6 o'clock the Christmas presentations. First at Henry, then here. And then you know about the 18th, we've talked about who all singing in the morning, but we haven't talked about the fact that on the 18th at 5 o'clock, what, my wife wants to say something? Well, I'll I have let a her. correction. Okay, well, hold on and I'll let you have the last word as usual. But this <laughs> one, but um, at 5 o'clock on the, on the, the 18th, we're going to have just a potluck, you bring it, we eat it kind of fellowship together. Um, Barbara, don't forget it, <laughs> because I intend to allow myself this once. Um, so that's what we'll be doing on those days, and Christmas Eve service at 5, Christmas morning at 10, no Sunday school. Carol Mack. Okay, I'm so thankful for y'all. One of my weaknesses is my memory, um, so and I'm thankful for my cell phone. So, Monday, November 28th at 3 o'clock <laughs> and finish Tuesday evening. If we don't um, finish tomorrow, then um, 5.30 on Tuesday. So thank you all for keeping me straight. Um, 3, o'clock 3 o'clock tomorrow. 3 o'clock tomorrow. 3 o'clock tomorrow. 3 o'clock tomorrow. And 5.30 later. Okay, so that's all good. I'm exhausted. <laughs> so... Everybody happy? Have we had a great time with the Lord today? Amen, we have. Let's pray together. Joey, would you go to the thing? I didn't, I failed to say this. If you're with us for the first time or the first time in a long while, uh, Joey will be at the welcome desk to tell you all about our church and get you signed up for PS 101 so you can know all about us and so we can know a little bit more about you also let's pray together father thank you for the day i pray that you would bless as we leave today help us to remember what we've heard what you've said that we've been in your presence and that nothing is impossible with you so lord i pray that you would take our weaknesses and lord as we leave today as we give our offerings i pray that we will do it with gladness of heart for the furtherance of your kingdom for we pray it in jesus name